At the time of release, online communities were quick to comment on the many references to past Bond films there were in Spectre. Whether they were intentional or not, I've collected together examples of how Bond 24 references every past Bond film. Some of these are tenuous at best, and are perhaps a result of me trying too hard, but most work quite well. First up is Dr. No. Here, the arrival at Blofeld's crater base reminds me of Bond's experience entering Dr. No's accommodation. There are lots of pleasantries exchanged, with slight hostile undertones from Bond. There's a fresh change of clothes for Bond and the girl, and are measured to fit. Blofeld wears a similar jacket to Dr. No, and Bond makes a similar comment to Blofeld along the lines of what he says to Dr. No. Our asylums are full of people who think they're Napoleon, or God. Compare this to the line from Spectre, where he says, Visionaries? Psychiatric wards are full of them. Finally, the Bond girl talks to Bond about having killed a man out of necessity. The most obvious comparison to From Russia of Love is the classic Bond train fight. More brutal than the battle between Bond and Red Grant, but it certainly reminds you of that classic fight scene. The train journey itself resembles the trip on the Orient Express, with the same old-fashioned decor, evening wear, and the fat romances involved. The Rolls-Royce Silver Wraith that picks Bond and Swan up when they get off the train happens to be a very similar model to the one owned by Karen Bay. Finally, the confrontation over the chessboard between Bond and White certainly provides a reminder to the chess scene involving Kronstein. There are numerous callbacks and references to Goldfinger, the first and most obvious being the fact it once again features the DB5. In the form of Bond's new DB10, numerous gadgets feature, activated by similar style buttons to the DB5. An ejector seat is amongst those gadgets. Bond once again appears dressed in a white tuxedo, and although this has happened in other Bond films, the inclusion of the red carnation can only ever remind you of the Goldfinger pre-title sequence. The Rolls-Royce that features is a reminder of Goldfinger's mode of transport, despite the models being different. Both films contain a strong, silent henchman, who both dress in a similar immaculate style. The dialogue between Blofeld and Bond, I came here to kill you, and I thought you came here to die, is reminiscent of the Do You Expect Me To Talk exchange. Bond acknowledges the white Persian with Hello Pussy, and Bond sees the approach of an enemy in a reflection. Both films contain a torture scene, and the opening credits also feature images from past Bond films. The clear comparison with Thunderball is the meeting of the Spectre Associates, albeit on a bigger scale, and with Bond gatecrashing. This meeting also features the death of a Spectre member for betraying the organisation, although the method of assassination is somewhat different. The Spectre rings also feature, providing members, and Bond, a means to spot other members, although the design is much more subtle and less obvious to the casual eye. Bond once again attends a funeral of a Spectre associate and has an involvement with the Widow. The Day of the Dead parade also has a similarity to the Junk Anu. Spectre was the closest a modern Bond film was going to get to having a base located in a hollowed out volcano. The Meteor Crater was a fitting location for a villain's base and had a hint of the over-the-top locations of old. The use of a crater links it most closely with Blofeld's other base in the already mentioned volcano. The reveal of Blofeld was also very similar, with his face hidden for some time before the reveal, when he directly speaks to Bond. The white Persian cat is present and correct, and both Blofelds have a scar over the right eye, although the more recent incarnation receives it as part of the events of the film. A bit more obscure, but Spectre is not the first time Bond has needed a piece of furniture to break his fall. This also occurs following his slide down to Tanaka's base of operations. Aside from the obvious musical cues in the trailer for this film, the film also opens with clips from previous Bond films, just like Majesties went to great pains to do to link Lazenby with Connery. The whole story is Bond falling in love and driving off at the end of the film in an Aston Martin with the girl, which provides an obvious parallel. The draft script even contained the line, we have all the time in the world. However, this goes a little further when you consider that both the women involved are the daughters of criminals, and Bond's involvement with these women was down to an offer to look after them in exchange for information about Spectre. This film also features an Alpine Health Clinic, which is a modern looking building, a parallel to Piz Gloria. Diamonds Are Forever is the first film where it's somewhat difficult to come up with references. However, 
Both Blofelds involved have hair. Mr Hinks has a similar name to that of Mr Wint and Mr Kidd, and both wear similar brown suits. In both films, Bond is seen talking to a rodent, a rat in diamonds, and a mouse in this film. The whole of the pre-title sequence provides you with reminders of Live and Let Die, thanks to the many skeletons on display, including Bond's, that can only ever remind you of Baron Samadhi. One of the posters also featured Craig in a similar style turtleneck to Moore's. This film also features one of the rare visits to Bond's flat. Both feature Bond driving a wingless plane, and a train fight occurs. Another obscure reference is the fact that in both films, when the watch's main function is activated, the display turns red. Golden Gun is where the references start getting spread a little thin. Having said that, the whole sequence with Bond making his way through MI6 HQ at the climax of the film, with images of himself, M, Vesper and past villains to taunt him, does give off a vibe of Scaramanga's Funhouse. And I never thought I'd be saying this for a Craig Bond film, but the evil Knievel stunt and infamous slide whistle are kind of reference when the helicopter in the pre-titles flies up vertical and then does a flip in the air. Decide for yourself. The main link with Spy is the henchman in the form of Mr Hinks and Jaws. Both are big and silent and difficult to kill. They also have a killer metal accessory. Metal teeth for Jaws and metal nails for Mr Hinks. The only other link is the inclusion of a train fight. Moonraker again shares the link with Jaws and the fact that both henchmen utter very few words. We also have Blofeld's computer-lined control room which resembles Drax's Amazon base of operations. The inclusion of the Rio Parade also draws parallels with the Day of the Dead festival. For your eyes only Inspector, both feature Bond dangling from the outside of a helicopter in the pre-title sequence following the return of Spectre. As for Links of Octopussy, well, 009 gets name-checked, and the way that Bond tells the security guard to stay is somewhat similar to the way he tells the tiger to sit. For a view to a kill, the helicopters used for both pre-title sequences are very similar models. Also, the final confrontation with the film's villain both happen to occur on a famous bridge. Yes, I know, scraping the barrel here. Both Daylight's Inspector share a number of locations, namely Tangier, Morocco, London and Austria. Not only that, but the plane smashing through the log cabin has similarities to the car chase. Both films show the main villain being apprehended rather than killed, a rarity in a Bond film. We see the return of a rogue Bond storyline of Spectre, just like in Licence to Kill. Although Bond doesn't have his Licence to Kill revoked, he does go against M's orders, having taken Bond off active duty. Mexico also features prominently in both films, and the villains of both do not wear socks. Q seem to be visiting Bond in the field, providing him with useful info, but also going behind M's back as a result. Bond is seen shooting at an enemy from a distance through a window, and he also tackles two enemies in a flying vehicle, chucking both of them out. There are reports that the hotel Bond enters with Estrella and climbs to the roof of is the same one that he attempts to kill Sanchez from. The pre-titles for Goldeneye resemble Spectre in the form of having to gain control of an aerial vehicle that is in a downward descent, managing to do so at the last minute. The timer that Blofeld sets to destroy the MI6 building is the same six minutes that Bond and Trevelyan both set their respective timers to, i.e. three minutes. In both films, it's clear Bond isn't happy that Moneypenny has some sort of social life which involves a lover. Bond is again seen behind the controls of a wingless plane, with the wings having been taken off by trees. The main villain is disfigured by the actions of Bond, He's able to see an enemy approaching, using a reflective surface, and the writings on the wall gets mentioned in the title song. The key similarity of Tomorrow Never Dies is the fact that Bond has a romantic interlude with the wife of the villain. Also, the scene in which Bond is waiting for Money Penny to arrive at his apartment is reminiscent of the scene where Bond is waiting in his hotel room when Paris arrives. Both Twine and Spectre feature some boat action on the River Thames, with Bond having launched the boat from MI6 HQ and passing the Houses of Parliament. During this sequence, he fires a standard handgun at Blofeld's helicopter, just like he did at the Caviar Factory. Also, Bond shooting at Blofeld, who's standing behind bulletproof glass, is very much like Bond's attempted shooting of Renard, who's standing in the lift. The torture scenes in both involve Bond strapped to a chair. 
Die Another Day features a car chase involving an Aston Martin and Jaguar, but both happen to be decked out with functioning gadgets unlike Spectre. The ejector seat facility of both Astons is used. Both films feature a villain disfigured due to an explosion caused by Bond. There are very obvious references between Craig's first three films and Spectre due to the fact they've been retconned to form one overarching storyline. Therefore I won't focus on every little thing that links these films with Spectre. However, it is interesting to note that the pattern of Craig's four films closely resembles Connery's first four outings. Film 1 has Bond dealing with a single member of a shadowy organisation. Film 2 opens up the organisation with Bond dealing with multiple members. Film 3 deals with a single villain, seemingly separated from the organisation already established, although this doesn't work as well with Sylvan now apparently being made a Spectre member. And Film 4 reveals the extent of the organisation, with Bond meeting a key figure behind it. As for references, the scene in which C discovers the gun has been emptied of bullets by M has a parallel scene in the form of the Casino Royale pre-title sequence. The smart blood to monitor Bond is very much like the microchip implanted in Bond's wrist. On both occasions, M is not trusting of Bond at the time. Both films also contain a torture scene, and there's a nice callback to Vesper when Bond finds her interrogation video in White's secret room. Links with Quantum include the inclusion of what looks like a DBS in Q's lab, and the presence of Mr White delivering similar lines and elaborating on those from the interrogation scene, regarding the organisation being everywhere. Finally, with Skyfall, we see the DB5, believed to be completely written off, being repaired by Q's technicians. We get a riff on the famous Q scenes from the past, about Bond bringing back one piece rather than bringing it back in one piece. Other random thoughts include the fact that M's office is back in Whitehall for the first time since Licence to Kill, not including its very brief appearance in Skyfall, and the office is back to the configuration last seen in A View to a Kill. Book references include the Hildebrand safe house referencing the Fleming short story The Hildebrand Rarity and the fact that the torture scene is very similar to the one from the first Bond continuation novel, Colonel Sun, with a lot of the same dialogue used. I think I'm right in saying that this is the first time a major part of a non-Fleming novel has been used as inspiration for a Bond film. If I've missed anything, please add it in the comments down below. And as always, thanks for watching.